Okay, so one thing is that everybody does uh, during DevOps talks is defining what DevOps is. So I'm not going to be an exception. I'm going to do this is the same thing, right? DevOps is a very broad term, and there are like a bunch of things like this, is like about config management, like running systems, and monitoring, and all this stuff. But uh, some say there's like a pony chasing a Batman riding a unicorn or something like that, right? That sometimes it goes wrong. Uh, but what I really like to talk about when I talk about DevOps is that DevOps is about a glue, glue stuff, right? It's about gluing, like, uh, you, you give APIs to processes and, and soft and more, and more like hardware things and convert them into software, and that's how you end up gluing things together. And this is what we do daily. Right, and when we talk about the glue, we talk about systems specified as code. So uh, I'm going to talk about the story in the context of a product we built inside our team that's called Microgram, which is a good pl platform for all things as Laura. And a Microgram is basically a, if you briefly describe it, it's a, an API for users that let they specify applications, group them into realms. You have a runtime uh, that makes it all work, and there is also a huge amount of machinery that makes things fail, because failing is a good thing, and we want to fail as fast as possible before, uh, and especially we want to try to fail before they actually solve the software happens to run in production, because, well, nobody got fired for aesthetic compile time errors rather than, like, production failure. Right, and when we speak about systems as code, we're talking about DSLs, and DSLs are everywhere. Right, so I'm going to go over some like classic Unix stuff that you probably have seen like dozens of times, and you're probably bored of it. But this is the password file, right? It's just a dumb CSV file that has d data separators as columns, and it doesn't contain any control flow. It just specifies what the users are and what their log shell logins are. Uh, but there's even more uh, smart config files and. Uh, in the SE directory, like if you ever use the BSD systems, there's a firewall called PF, which has things like, um, which, which is basically a firewall configuration language, it is a language that lets you specify what packets you would like to pass and what like packets you would like to not pass. But apparently, you can just specify with some declarative thing by saying which packets you don't like or, or you do like because you have to keep state in your firewall and do a bunch of a bunch of sorts of things and you want to abstract over the configuration. So this language contains things like macros, it contains things like table references, and it even contains things like flow control definitions. Like if you say, uh, so by default, if you evaluate your rule set, in PL, this means that the last matching rule wins, and you can override the flow control by saying quick and, and say that the first matching rule wins. So you can redefine the flow control, right? This is the configurations for the most popular a mail transfer agent in the world, I guess. It was written by Eric Oldman, it's called SendMail, and it has a configuration language that's, that has to be preprocessed by M4. And if you've never used M4, I'm really happy for you guys. Yeah. Uh, so this is like a default example of rule set here that says that this rule ensures that all local mail is delivered using the SMTP transport. Everything else will go by the smart house. And of course, you can tell by this line that this is what really happens, right? If you don't see this behind, I'll share the slides later, right? So, and M4 is kind of a very controversial language because it's also used in a bunch of weird tools that most Unix people have to use every day, like auto tools, right? And, and, and you have to write M4 if you want to build your C program, most likely, and this is really bad. Uh, so, now I'm going to talk about some more hipster stuff, which is JSON, right? Which is like a term serialization format that's been used everywhere for the last, like, 10 years or so. And it has some really primitive data structures, and it has lists, it has dicts, it has strings, and uh, it has numbers, right? Uh, there's also a <coughs> variant of JSON, which, has, uh, which is YAML, which is apparently is so good that you can sell it for $100 million, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, YAML is just an, a format that's totally isomorphic to JSON, but it's syntactically different, and its specification format is 100 pages long or so, and it's barely implemented, properly implemented by every library that supports YAML. And the thing in, in here is you can see that 
uh, there's this magic thing uh, that is string interpolation. And this means that the thing that reads this config file, it preprocesses it and tries to replace those variables inside. But this is not supported by the configuration format. This is supported by the library that reads this thing. And it plugs in its own template li string library to do those uh, splits. But you can't really tell that this is a variable because there is no visible definition of the scope. And I just, you, you can't even tell that this is a real program because this is just a chunk of text, right? Apparently, you can even do programming with YAML because uh, given that the language is just a simple term solicitation format, you can pretend that you have flow control. And, you, and authors of Yans Ansible, they even embedded um, flow control declare it like imperative predicates into the language, except here they stopped using uh, string interpolation syntax and used just a syntax pretending that this is actually a string, but it's not, it's actually code. And this is really confusing, right? But apparently it gets worse. So if you've ever seen CloudFormation, this is the tool by Amazon that lets you specify your huge stack of application using a two kilometer long JSON file. And this is just a sing simple snippet of it that has a triple nested term that has this weird thing that says append join uh, percent sign comma a string ref aws colon colon stack name. And apparently if you had a weird Lisp dream in your third year university and you've seen Lisp and you've heard that like John McCarthy told that you can encode data as code, well code is data, uh, so you might think that this is like some Lispy notation for doing code, and apparently it is, right? You call some function that you reference by a string, and then, then you reference something else using other string, and you expect there's gonna be, gonna be some tooling that's gonna evaluate that, right? So apparently, when I was showing this kind of neat JSON syntax, it's, it was kind of oh, cool that the number stands out from the string, and you can tell them apart by syntax. But when you start adding programming primitives to things like JSON, you can no longer do that, right? This is horrible, people. OK, so now I'm going to bash and pop it. Hey, pop it, guys. Uh, so I thought that is, is actually a pretty neat language. It's like a resource-oriented DSL. It, it has some things like, well, it, it, it tries to isolate side effects and provide you a language where you can think in terms of resources, right? But apparently, you can mess, mess this up as well. So uh, there's a, a note in the Puppet documentation that although Puppet's language is built around describing resources and relations between them, several parts of the language do depend on the evaluation order. So apparently, like, well, Puppet had to get this wrong historically because they like, changed the language a lot of times. And there are cases where, uh, where you can redefine scoping by using like, an import statement. And like, import code is going to evaluate separately from your from, from the rest of the code, there are like in unclear uh, scoping resolution rules to a programmer, and so you have to read about a, a lot of documentation to figure out how scoping works and stuff like that. But the language itself is pretty common because well, it has this very simple abstraction of resource, and it's kind of extendable. But the problem with extending uh, Puppet is that Puppet is a huge DSL is reading around Ruby. And every time you have to extend Puppet code, you have to write Ruby. And every time you have to add a new type or any, any new provider for, for the resource, you have to write Ruby code. And this means that extension of the language is not the part of the language. It's not first class. This means Puppet is limiting you. And apparently, like I said, in 1930s, um, uh, Alonzo George, showed us how we can encode data as code. And in 1950s, John McCarty told us that we can encode uh, code as data. And in the 1990s, apparently, we learned that separating them is cool again. <laughs> and uh, we have to separate our data into a bunch of YAML files, because apparently Puppet's language is not declarative enough, right? Or they have to make use case for buying a Puppet Enterprise database. So you can actually separate your code from uh, from the definitions of your infrastructure, right? Sorry, Puppet. Uh, so about, no, no chef, so you can not really get alone, right? Uh, so a chef is, is basically Ruby code, right? And Ruby code means like, when you write Ruby, it means you can shoot yourself in the feet constantly while writing your infrastructure definition, right? 
<laughs> and uh, apparently, uh, Chef tries to avoid some of these problems by trying to embed Ruby inside Ruby. So if you want to write real Ruby, you have to say that I'm writing Ruby right now. It's not the Ruby that you think it is. It's the real Ruby, guys. <laughs> and you have to write in the code here. Because well, yeah, it's interpreted, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because well, like there's a different context of interpretation of the block, but you can't tell that apart except you actually like read tons of documentations. Like you have to know this stuff. This is like a job security market for DevOps to actually figure out how to like which blocks to embed, embed where. Okay, uh, now the XML, right? So apparently, I like to repeat things two times. I like to repeat things two times, right? And this is what XML is about. And this is actually stuff that's meant to be written by humans, right? And, and, like, and like, there's a company called JetBrains that sell IDEs that let you write XML, so apparently there's also a market for doing that. And there's also a programming language that can be embedded inside XML. And of course I can like saying things two times, I like saying things two times, but this is what the language like gives you, right? Okay. Well, let me just like catch a breath and stuff. Um, you guys have no power here. What I'm trying to say is, like all of these languages, they have all sorts of weird artificial limitations, right? You have to like, you have to write Ruby inside Ruby. You have to extend some DSL using Ruby, or you have to say that um, you have to write XML for God's sake. And there are tons of Java code that just like parse that XML, right? So. There was a nice thing, like there was a Cisco talk yesterday, and the speaker mentioned <coughs> that, like, there's like a problem with auto scaling. Like, people are you not know, doing auto scaling in a smart way. They just have to provision a bunch of infrastructure for the peaks, and they, that's how they handle it. But why do they handle peaks in such a dumb way? B not by using any common algorithms to actually do predictions or um, use the statistic analysis to do auto scaling. It's just because our languages. The DevOps have to use daily suck. We can't simply write some code that uses historical information uh, because we have to like a huge Ruby plugin that parses the YAML file and feeds it in another JSON file and then spits it out as an XML, right? And then feeds it using Amazon APIs using some CLI tools that, for, that change the file formats over time, and this is a total mess. You can't really get to do an actual work. You have to like write these files, okay? So the, the point I'm trying to make that systems are actually code, and you have, and every DevOps guy is a programmer, and a programmer deserves proper tools, right? So I'm gonna like go down like a simple case study to show how, uh, how screwed uh, is our world. So consider like MariaDB multi software application, and consider if you're like a multinational company, you have like a bunch of countries and you have a bunch of data servers, uh, and like consider you have this cool YAML file that specifies a map that says like you have you have countries and then you have database servers, right? Um, if you wanna if you wanna build an application that configures multi source application, you have to somehow invert this this data structure because the, the model of our company is being country centric and the model of MariaDB channels is server centric. Right, right here, some countries are sharing servers. So what do we gotta do? We gotta aggregate, right? And one well, of the other points I was trying to make is that uh, using insufficiently uh, expensive DSLs, so uh, in, in normal speak, it's poorly designed DSLs, leads you to, to using ultimate system integration tools, right? And this is what I was, this is the tool that you have to use like to convert YAML to JSON and then feed it to the API and then back and forth and stuff. So I'm gonna talk about that. <laughs> of course, like this is the ultimate systems integration tool that you guys use daily. It's just, it is like the most horrible programming language ever that you have to use daily as well, right? So you can just write a simple script, right? That does the aggregation, spits it out in a different form. But, um, so, when I was young and stupid, I was actually enjoying doing that. It was so cool that you can express your opinions in like in in four lines of code, right? That's actually a single string. And when I was showing them to my coworkers and and I wanted to prove how smart I am, they were showing, "Hey, I like this code. It's obfuscated even before you wrote it." <laughs> 
And, and of course, you can tell if you stare for like 40 minutes that it's like, you know, it's an aggregation or the key and then you print the keys and that's it, right? And there's also some magic that's, that kind of pretends that you have lists. So you write strings and separate them by commas, right? But this is not entirely obvious from the first sight, right? So Bash is like, an actual thing is like, if, if you see JSON again, uh, you, can, you can tell strings from numbers apart, right? The, these, these things have quotes and these things do, do not, right? And in Bash, that is not the case. Everything you see is a string. And the coercion of the type depends on the context of the operation you're doing. And this is like, this is so bad. I don't know. I can't even say that without swearing. So, what do you do when you want to tackle this kind of refactoring? So, do you rewrite this code manually if you don't want to do Bash, right? Do you use a random script, even a bash script, and you want to do it in your Puppet reprocessing stage? Because Puppet isn't a uh, language that's declarative enough to let you do a simple aggregation of data structure because your data is apparently in YAML again, right? Or in Puppet Enterprise Database where you have to write SQL. Or you write a plugin, right? Or you write an abstract aggregation virtual method factory factory. Hello, big Java guys, right? Or find a better template engine that whatever Ansible is using. Or so, and I'm slowly coming to the fact, why don't we just use a proper language? Like an expressive language to actually say all those things we mean every day. All right, so we found a way to scale Bash. Right? And we scale Bash using expressive language using this called Nix. Okay, so this is the code that, that does the same aggregation. Except, well, it's, it's, it, Nix is a functional language, and it allows you to say like pretty cool things, right? And, you can, you can express that operation of aggregating things by views and then uh, choosing small values as, as a map reduce operation. So the code we write here is big data compatible. Right? So you can write big data compatible code in functional languages. Uh, so, but this is not like the part of the next module that we, that we love to scale batch. So for example, consider a regular batch script that <coughs> that does something clever that, 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 that submits a DNS entry, right? And, and the, the things about bash scripts, they, they use a ton of dependencies, like, like you have to, when you write a bash script, you have to explain that you use like open cell 1.01j and you use curl version 7.18 compiled with secure transport support and all those stuff, right? And those, those are dependencies that are not expli expli explicitly clear in the code. Uh, so the core of the Nexus mojo is that you can take those dependencies, put them into variables. Uh, Nexus is going to magically interpret those interpolations into batch build operations. So it's going to uh, reference your script with actual paths to bash, and when you're going to transfer this code around, it's going to pass the dependencies with it, which is pretty cool. Which is like what a package manager does, except it's not. It's not. Doesn't make you want to kill yourself. Um, so this is what you do, is like, uh, you just replace it with string interpolations, which you get from here, and you get a proper bash script that contains all of its dependencies. And this is like the essence of Nix and how it used to scale batch, right? So it's a functional language uh, to, to be boring, like dynamically tied, it has lightweight schema validation, and it has one side effect, which is the thing that lets you build packages, which basically wraps the script around in something that can be transferable to another box with all these dependencies. Basically, it tracks uh, a, a graph of dependencies for every file by doing some smart, uh, some smart things. Uh, so another case study is like configuring <coughs> Jenkins. Like, everybody uses Jenkins here? Seriously, people, like, nobody uses Jenkins? <laughs> it's just, you, you, you don't have to be shy about this. I mean, like, we all do this. I mean, <laughs> it's OK. So, how do you configure Jenkins, right? If you have like a thousand build jobs, would you write a Selenium script to click through the form? <laughs> Are there actually people here who did that? Oh, really? Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, like, yeah, well, you can you can click through the forms, right? But you can also read like a ton of like those XML sheets that I've shown you, because like same thing two times is apparently good. Uh, so, can we build a ZSL? Yes, we can. Like, we can capture the essence of what we're doing in a tiny script, the thing, capture like the keys we, we want to use, and capture the triggers, and move everything else into a library that, that we don't touch from, don't touch very often. Uh, we can write some functional stuff. 
uh, it generated ma many jobs using a function called map, which is a hard order function that just maps things over the list. Uh, and we can move term generation to separate library and make it look nice and make it look better than XML. Right? We also use, uh, on top of Nix, we use a thing that's called NixOS, which is basically a distribution of Linux that's uh, it's based on the Nix, on Nix packages. And it means that we can describe every package in our system using the language that we're showing you. That's what we do. We can easily build immutable uh, system images using these, these expressions, and we can easily change <coughs> them, and and they will and the next machinery will trigger the rebuilds automatically for every dependency that's affected. Like whenever we change open and sell version, next ensures that every other package that we use is linked against that open and sell library because then like you can't mistake because between among admins that you put a new dynamic library in place to do the upgrade. But you also have to restart a bunch of programs that you're using open as a seller because otherwise you haven't done a security upgrade. Or if you're using immutable systems, you can have, you have to actually make sure that you kill the old systems and you put the new ones in place. And it means that you have to have a, some really convenient and quick operations to make sure that images are built. And like tools like Packer that are commonly advertised they're quite good, but they're quite slow. Uh, so another thing that you can specify that using this language is the infrastructure specification. Well, basically like that. But uh, the thing is, like, there are a bunch of other cool languages that you can specify your infrastructure in, like Amazon Cloud Formation, right? You can just write two kilometers of JSON and just feed it to Amazon. It's kind of figure it everything, figure everything out. But uh, what's cool about here, we can define our own DSL for anything else, like like infrastructure, and either print this over and hand it to the guy who provisions the infrastructure, or convert this to cloud formation, or convert this to Terraform specifications, or run our <coughs> own tool that provisions things in the way that we want, and scale it if we need to. Right? We also can do a bunch of cool things, like pluggable static verification, right? Like the, there was this good speech about inclusive, inclusiveness and, and like embedding security into the CID process. What we, for example, did here is that we embedded static checks of bash scripts into the build process. So whenever we using the shell check tool, and whenever there are any static errors, the whole build of the whole system fails and doesn't get deployed. So we fail early instead of figuring out the bash script that you deployed like 30 minutes ago already started running your branch of code and just fail in production. This is, you can use some very dumb tools and embed, this, embed them into the build process before you actually make, become sorry because they're being safe, right? So, like, Nix is a, is a metric tool that let us replace, like, the package manager. It let us do an json isomorphic torrents with macros, which are those fun functions you could treat them as macros, but they're just functions, and those are just torrents. <coughs> they just happen to be isomorphic to json, which means that you can spit it out, spit out any term to json, right? And it helps us replace tools like Poppins and Chef by using proper uh, by using proper expression language that we compile to anything we want. But we also get a package manager for free, which lets us replace a bunch of things that uh, uh, these classical state conversion conversion systems do. Because we do not converge state, we just throw the old state away and we put a new one in place. So the thing is, our experiences with Next is that there's this it's a sign, not a cough. Uh, and dynamic language, any other dynamic language like JavaScript and like Python and Ruby, they all have this problem that you can't really abstract things away properly because uh, a dynamic language is a is a very good way to shoot yourself in the foot using your own things that you've just built. And so apparently there, there's a really big need to improve on that. Since we get um, we already have a functional language, and we already can efficiently compose all of those weird, weird languages using the unified uh, DSL building machine. All right? But we also lack something else. Uh, we also lack uh, the use of some formal methods to help us constrain the code that we actually write. And Haskell is a, language, uh, is a functional language that lets you do that. It has a very powerful type system embedded into it that, that you can use to uh, to make your code safer e e even more. So we, we have already some experience with Haskell on our team and we're gonna like 
these many tools. And these have shown that like language is quite powerful to do very simple things with little amounts of code. It, it seems hard to get them right for the first time, but we, we, as we're agile and we improve all the time, we, we happen to get our code better. And you can check it out already on, the, <coughs> on GitHub. Uh, it's open source. Like most of the tools that we're actually doing are open source, except except our main tool that we break all the time. So we're really trying to open source and get. So yeah, so this is like the mode of Haskell, right? Because the Haskell is confirmed that th this is the type of the expression. You can just compose this with another expression of the similar type. Right? Uh, so thing, the type system lets you build things that are correct by construction. Like for example, imagine a B3 data structure uh, which, which has which has some constraints on, like you, you can't insert it into B3 and make it unbalanced because it's going to make lookup operations uh, not, not logarithmic. And this means you can use a type system to enforce those constraints so you can never insert a new node in the tree and keep it unbalanced. So you always have to make sure that like your leaves are not bigger than like, in the two three B trees are never bigger than like three nodes and then you have to do these like uh, you have been doing these null checks and then rub the tree and all this stuff, and you can just enforce those constraints in the type system as you use your code, right? And this is like the example of a very stupid DSL we actually use to extract from Bash. So we actually use drag by construction drag practices to try safer Bash code and limit our, <coughs> and limit our the ways we use Bash to prevent from ourselves from doing bad things. Uh, there's also a simple example of using correct by construction web APIs where you can specify the whole structure of web, web API as a type. And then you can have some really powerful type system machinery to generate functions that operate on the type by just knowing the shape. Like here we can specify a new relic deployment API using just four lines of, uh, of code and, and then generate a type safe API uh, code uh, for it even not even by writing any code, we just write a type. Uh, also, another thing that you you can help yourself to do is like develop a lot about handling side effects, like provisioning <coughs> the structure to it costs money. <coughs> and if you like your batch script suddenly provisions hundred more instances, your your company is going to pay for it, and, and it would be really cool to prevent that, right? Unless you're Google, because you own the infrastructure and you have to pay for it. Right? That's why they use Java. Uh, so. You can, you can say in the type that this is the computation that has an R such that it does these effects and this does those effects and it gives you a map of a machine to an exit code. And we have this function that's called WTF, which you probably know what it does, right? It just, it just figures out what the infrastructure you have in the realm, uh, defined by this thing. Uh, it g finds a list of machines in that realm and it traverses them. It traverses, it's a higher order function that lets you uh, let's you construct your computation using a, a powerful data structure from abstract algebra. Let's call it implicative functor that lets you lets you implicitly make the effects parallel, which is pretty cool because we say you use a higher order function that doesn't say anything about the the uh, the the operational semantics of the computation. We can define that elsewhere. And this is pretty great. Uh, and we, of course, can specify what the effects are and basically say with types things that we always do, like we do, uh, we execute things on the machines, right? And we specify what machine we want to do this on and what common line we want to try and when get, get back a, an exit code. And then we can post them those using higher order functions. Then we write effect interpreters that uh, handle effects separately from our code so we can write mocks, tests, and whatever, right? So, and it's pretty cool that we, you can use a type system to integrate with all the weird string reward that I've shown you. And like, yeah, like Unix, like if there, there are people who are doing performance analysis, they have ever looked into a right? Uh, and the Procrefest is a, is a Linux interface that adds human error into machine-to-machine -machine communication. That's what actually Brian Cantrell said that, that, that this building is hilarious and they have a Procrefest that has a binary interface and it's actually formally specified. And for Linux, you have to write a bunch of parsers. And if you write a Perl script that's longer than 40 lines and you look at it the next day, you're, you're probably not going to understand what it does. And the same happens to awk scripts and set scripts and like Ruby scripts. Well, Ruby, okay, Ruby's a little nicer, whatever. Don't look at me like it's so hard. Uh, so 
We actually used one. So actually, I, I was as I was really crazy about writing really hard like awk one-liners, and I was actually was using make files to compose them. And I was writing some script that was going on to figure out what the infrastructure does, like collect processes and figure out like what TCP connections they have between them. And the next day, I I woke up and I wanted to edit the script. I didn't really read. I couldn't really read it because everything like every type annotation to the code I had in my mind it it was gone from my head the next day. And, and in Haskell, you get a program that actually checks those things, the types match up for you. And it's actually free. You don't have to pay anything for that. And there are no enterprise subscriptions. It's just free stuff that's just given away. And there are a bunch of other things like you can look up on, on, on our GitHub like, to see how we use it. There are some notable tools like Propeller, which is like a state convergence system that lets like ensure that properties are uh, insured on on the system like Puppet. Um, we don't actually use it for other reasons. There's also a, a DSL for specifying build systems, and there's also a rewrite of Puppet in Haskell that actually fully functional and being actively developed. So Puppet base, you can check it out. There's a rewrite uh, of Puppet in a nice language, and there's also a really good idea of using literal Haskell, like this thing is coming from, from more of the academic background. It says that you can write text and like intertwine this with code and it, it lets you implement concepts like literate DevOps. Like a lot of operations, especially between uh, in emerging companies with clearly defined processes, um, they have this thing where, where they have to do a bunch of changes that are very ad hoc, and they have to communicate using the uh, using something. And there's like a concept of doing chat ops, where you say everything on the chat, and like everybody reads it. But there's also a way of just saying this in text, and like commit your code as documentation, like into text intertwined with code. And there's a really nice screencast about how doing that with Emacs, but it's mostly using Bash, but you guys can do it with Haskell. So. You don't want to know what I'm capable of. <laughs> this is the thing that I want to want to hear you say when you exit this room, and actually go online and figure out all those concepts and apply them to your day-to-day -day job because it's going to make your your professional uh, <laughs> development and your day-to-day -day operations a lot easier and a lot more fun. So. Do not sacrifice exclusivity for cheap wins like Ansible, except you're going to sell it for a hundred million dollars. So, and keep the user happy. Thank you very much. <laughs>